start off by giving you a strange sort of a lesson. You have to keep that in mind so you can appreciate the lessons of this ayah as, as well as possible in the short time that we have. In the English language, we have something called synonyms, right? So, for example, choosing and selecting can be considered the same thing. I selected this and I chose this is pretty much the same meaning, right? Uh, or I'm somebody's happy or somebody's joyous or somebody's angry or somebody's upset. These are words that are close in meaning to each other. And they're, even though there may be some differences between them, we, we tend to use them interchangeably. Allah, when He speaks, He sometimes uses the same word or the same meaning, but different words. And specifically, what I want to talk to you about today is the different words Allah uses for choice, for making a choice. And in this case, it is Allah Himself choosing. In this passage, Allah says, for example, that He chooses angels and He chooses human beings, some of them, to become messengers. Not all the angels are messengers. Some of them were chosen, like Jibreel alayhi salam is chosen. And the ones that follow him are chosen. And among human beings, some human beings are chosen by Allah to be messengers. Later on in this passage, the ayah I want to talk to you about today, Allah says again, He chose you. He's talking to the ummah, the Muslims, and he says he chose you. Every one of us is also chosen. But the word Allah used for his prophets is something else. The word for choice Allah used is something else. And the word for choice of the believers, you and me, Allah chose us also, is something else. Now this is the beauty of the Arabic language, that every word, even though in English we translate it pretty much the same way, that each of them has their own flavor, has their own meaning. And so I'm going to give you an example to try to help you understand the difference between these two kinds of choice. The word Allah uses for choosing prophets, messengers, He says, Allah yastafi min al malaikati rusulan wa min nas The word is yastafi. And to make it see easy for you, sometimes you make a choice when you owe no one an explanation. It's your personal preference. That's it. If somebody asked you, why did you choose it? It's because I chose it. There's no scientific explanation. There's no rationale. There's nothing. So for example, you go to the grocery store and you pick up a Kit Kat and your wife says, why didn't you get the Twix? Why not the Snickers? Why not all the other things that will give you diabetes? Why did you pick Kit Kat? And you say, I like Kit Kat. No, give me a rational explanation. Explain to me why you chose. Okay, let me help you understand. Because I like it. That's it. It's your preference. You don't owe an explanation. You understand? The same way when you go and buy a shirt and you pick a color you like, it's your choice. That's entirely up to you. And those kinds of preferences are called istifa. They're purely your own. It comes from the word safwa. And safwa means purity. It means purity. And so when a choice is made purely on one's own, and you cannot be asked, why did you choose this person? Now let me contrast this for you. Maybe you work in the human resources department at some company, and your job is to do the interviews for people that are applying for a job, right? And somebody, you know, five people applied for a job, and you, one of them, you gave the job. You said, this is the person we should hire. And then your boss says, why do you think we should choose this person? You say, because he's wearing a blue shirt, and he had a Kit Kat. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Because when you make that choice, then it has to be based on qualifications. Does he have the right experience? Does this person have the right education? Are they a good fit for our team? Did they, how, did they do well on the interview? There are other questions that led to that choice. That's not just personal preference, you understand? When Allah says He chose messengers, He says, Allahu yastafi. Allah made that choice, you don't get to ask questions, why? You don't get to say, why did Allah choose Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Why not someone else? The Quraysh asked, how come this Qur'an didn't come to one of the two, you know, a man from one of the two great cities, a great man, in other words, Taif and Makkah are the big cities of the Arabian region of that time, and they have plenty of millionaires, plenty of politicians, plenty of famous people, and people listen to them already. And Rasulullah was actually raised pretty much an orphan, not very well known, He's not a celebrity, he doesn't have political power, he doesn't have economic power, he doesn't have any of these things. Why should, he, why should Allah choose him? He should have chosen someone who's got more chances of being heard. That's the rationale they offered. And really in response to all those kinds of questions, by the way, the Israelites asked, how come he wasn't one of us? How come God chose one of the Gentiles, one of the Arabs? That can't be a prophet. We're supposed to be the, the nation that Allah chooses messengers from. You know, we're the, we're the chosen people. Different nations had different criticisms of why, why is he the right choice? Some even say, well, why, why Arabia? Why couldn't we have a Greek prophet or a German prophet or whatever other prophet? Why, why do you have to have an Arab prophet? Allah's response to that is he does istifa, which means he owes no one an explanation. 
He chooses. And that's, it's not your place to ask. It's not my place to ask. And he shuts all of those questions down by saying, Allahu yastafi min al malaikati rusulan wa min al nas. But when it comes to us, he used a different word. He said, huwajdabakum. And I won't explain that to you yet. I'm going to start, because that's not happening in the beginning of this ayah that I want to share with you. It's happening a little bit further down. Allah begins by saying, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ Struggle, jihad means struggle. Struggle with no goal before you except Allah. Be clear that every struggle you're making, Allah is in your vision. And do that in the way that Allah deserves. I'm being very rough and easy with the translation for the purposes of khutbah. Struggle for the sake of Allah the way He deserves it. Try to do things for Allah the way He deserves it. Now, the issue is that that's practically impossible. None of us prays to Allah the way He deserves it. None of us thanks Allah the way He deserves it. None of us obeys Allah the way He deserves it. None of us remembers Allah the way He deserves it. That's impossible. No matter how much you do, you and I can never actually fulfill how much Allah actually deserves. وَأَصْبَغَ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعَمَهُ ظَاهِرَةً وَبَاطِنًا Allah says He unleashed His favors on you, the ones you can see and the ones you can't even see. The ones that are obvious and the ones that are hidden away. How can I even thank Allah for things I can't even acknowledge? I don't even know they're hidden from me and they're being done to me. Favors that are happening inside of my body right now that are happening from Allah, I am not even aware of them. And yet, Allah knows that He's doing them, I can't. One of the most fa favored slave of, uh, slaves of Allah, one of the most grateful human beings of Allah, Allah describes Ibrahim alayhi salam saying, Shakiran li an'umihi. He was grateful to Allah's favors. But the word an'um is, so those of you who know a little bit of sarf, it's considered jam'u qilla, which means he was grateful for only a few favors of Allah. It doesn't mean many favors, it means a few favors. Now that sounds inappropriate. Ibrahim alayhi salam was grateful for a few favors of Allah. Well, no, actually compared to the number of favors Allah has done, a human being, even if they spent their entire life being grateful like Ibrahim alayhi salam, that would only amount to a few favors that you were actually able to be grateful for. And there's so many unlimited more that you and I cannot even count, much less be grateful for. So Allah says, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا If you try to count or encircle, completely grasp the favor of Allah, you can't. And in that remarkable ayah, he didn't even say the favors of Allah. If you were to, you and I can't even fully appreciate one favor of Allah. Ni'mat Allah. That's ismu jins here, it's mufrad also. One single favor of Allah I can't fully appreciate. One favor of Allah is my ability to see. One single favor of Allah. In how many ways is that one single favor of Allah helping me? I can't even count. How many ways has it saved my life? How many ways is it providing for me? How many ways is it giving me joy? How many ways is it preventing harm from, from me? It's, the, it's countless. Per second, it's countless. So even one favor we can't. Now I come back to the point. Allah says, I want you to struggle for me the way I deserve it. And I'd like to give you a comparison again to help, help we visualize this problem. You go for a job interview and you don't know any programming. You're not a programmer. You have no technical background. Your resume under technology says Google. And Microsoft Word, and that's pretty much it. You know nothing else. And you go for this job interview, and the interview says, yeah, well, for this job, you need the following coding languages, and at least 10 years experience in this language, this language, and he starts listing languages. And you're just listening there, sitting, and you have to have management experience, and you've had to have developed mobile apps for at least five years, and you have to have a portfolio of at least 20 projects. And he's going on and on and on, and you're sitting there, it's a 30 minutes this guy's going on, and you're sitting there going, can he just stop so I can say sorry, this is not me, and I can leave and save myself the embarrassment? Because he's looking at your resume that has none of those qualifications, and he's telling you how impossible this job is for you. I mean, how am I qualified for that? And at the end of that interview, he looks at you and says, congratulations, you start tomorrow. Well, if he said that, you'd be sitting there, no, I, I, that's not me, I can't do that job, I'm not qualified for this. Why are you choosing me? Allah says to you and me, you will struggle for me the way I deserve. My immediate response is, I'm not qualified. How am I qualified? This is way up here. And I'm way down here. I think you might have me, somebody else might be a better fit for this job. And Allah then says, Now He says, He in fact 
He alone has chosen you. He's the one that's chosen you. First, he gives the impossible job description. Then he says, you're the right fit for the job. And the word he used, ijtiba, is different from, remember for istifa, I said it's a choice. Allah owes no explanation. There's no explanation. Like he chooses prophets, messengers. You don't ask him why. But when you say ijtiba, it comes from the word jabu. And jabu actually was used when you collect taxes back in the day. And taxes were collected from those who were qualified. They made enough kind of money. If somebody's homeless, you can't collect taxes from them. They have to have a minimum kind of income, so they qualify, and then you make that choice. Now, let me put that in simple words for you. Some of you work, for example, you're fixing your car, or you're, fixing some, you're putting furniture together, and there's a screw, and you have to tighten that screw. You have to pick the right kind of tool for this kind of job, you understand? You can't pick a hammer for this. You need a screwdriver and the right kind of screwdriver, you understand? When you pick the right tool for the right job, that's called ijtiba. When something fits the job, and you make that choice, that's called ijtiba. What I'm trying to get at is, Allah sees in you, and He sees in me, something that He decided, of all the other billions of people in the world, you should get to say, La ilaha illallah. You should get to say, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He sees something in you, that qualifies you to struggle for Him. He selected you. And it's a wise, it's the right fit for the job. I don't even see that qualification in myself. He sees it. He sees it. And now I take you back to the example I gave you. The guy says, you start your job tomorrow. Clearly, you're not qualified. Even if you bring me to the job and sit me on a desk with a keyboard in front of me and you want me to start coding, I'm just going to write my personal story. Maybe my resignation letter is what I'll be typing. I don't know what else I, I can do. And he knows. And he says, look, I know you're confused. I know you don't think you know what you're doing. But I know talent when I see it. I've been doing this a long time. And I know you're capable of this. And I know for a fact, when I train you, this is going to be easy for you. You're going to be surprised at yourself. In other words, your interviewer sees something in you you can't even believe about yourself. Allah Azza wa Jal in the next phrase of this ayah says, وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ He did not place any discomfort in the religion for you. Listen to these words. Haraj actually means tightness of chest, discomfort, hard to breathe. This is haraj. He didn't put any restriction, difficulty, anxiety, pressure in the religion for you. In other words, first Allah says you have an impossible job. And even though you're not qualified, you're chosen. Then he gives you comfort and says, listen, I know you think you're not qualified. I'm going to make this easy for you. وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ You know you, it looks impossible, but I'm the one who makes it easy. What cannot be looked at as easy or you know, something you can progress in or something you can ever be able to do, Allah will remove the difficulties from your path. وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ Any difficulty whatsoever, I have not put for you in the way of your religion. So you take a sigh of relief. Okay, Allah said He's going to make it easy. I can do this. I got this. And then come the next words of this ayah. Allah says, مِلَّةَ أَبِيكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمُ He says, you are the continuity of the legacy of your father, Ibrahim. So he makes reference to which prophet? Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now hold on a second. Ibrahim alayhi salam, of all the prophets, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Because when you think of Ibrahim alayhi salam and the struggles he had to do, they were pretty easy, right? I mean, he only had to leave his family in the middle of a desert and walk away. And when his son finally grew up, he only had to take a knife and... Or he had to, even when he was younger, he had to challenge his own father, take on the entire town, get thrown into a fire. When you think of the things Ibrahim السلام, had to do, you don't think of easy tests. Allah Himself says, When Allah tested, when His Master tested Ibrahim السلام, thoroughly, these weren't easy tests. This is the kind of test that no human being you know, after Him was given, the way that He was tested. And yet Allah says, You, this job that you have, is actually a continuity of the same legacy as who? Ibrahim alayhi salam. So a moment ago he said things are going to be easy, relax. مَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ And you feel relaxed and he says, by the way, you're on the same train as Ibrahim alayhi salam. And you get like, uh, what fire am I going to have to jump into? What's, what's, what's happening here? I thought this was easy. 
This is a profound lesson from Allah. Allah is telling you and me that Ibrahim alayhi salam, I asked him to jump into a fire. I asked him to leave his family in the middle of a desert. You guys, those, some, some of you are family men. Some of you have children, wife and children, and you travel with them. When you travel two hours in the summer in Texas, can we stop? Can we get some water? I need some Gatorade. I need soda. I need ice cream. Oh my God, there's a McDonald's. Can we pull over? What air conditioning did they have when they took the road trip to Mecca? What rest stops did they have? Can you imagine? What shade did, what trees did they get shade under? And when they finally get there, when, when are we going to get there? When is this excruciating journey going to be over? When they get there, they're in the heat of the Meccan desert. And then the father says, I'm leaving. Allah, Allah's command, he's leaving. And he's going to leave wife and kid behind. Your wife and child, if they're at the airport and you're one hour late to pick them up, when you're 30 minutes late or you're texting them, they don't text you back, what happens to you? You start getting a heart attack, what happened to them? Where are they? I've been calling for 30 minutes, you haven't picked up. The phone was ringing, it wasn't going straight to voicemail. Where were you? What's wrong with you? Why did I get you a phone anyway? 30 minutes of no contact, you go insane. Can you imagine what Ibrahim salam went through? That, that, that crying baby and that, his mother in the middle of the desert, that they walk away. To not know what's going on with your child. Sometimes you're late to pick up your kid from school. You know, and you got stuck in traffic. And nobody at the school is picking up and you don't know where your child is until you get there. What your child goes through, what you go through. Ya Rab, this, the, the trials of Ibrahim salam were so massive, they're so difficult to comprehend. I can't imagine when, when, you know, our children, when they're even playing near a swimming pool, we run and pull them away. When our two, three year old is going to grab a knife, we, hey, get away from there. Put that away, put, put everything dangerous in the middle of the table so they can't reach and get it. And now you have your own son and you have to take a knife and you have to put it on his neck. We, this is beyond imagination. Allah says when He can make that easy, when He can make that easy, what are you going to complain about? Did he, did he ask you to jump into a fire? Did He ask you to leave your family in the middle of a desert? I've put you on the same track as Ibrahim salam. He can make those things easy. You have nothing left to worry about. You're on that legacy. Millata abikum Ibrahim. He's the one who named you Muslim way before and even now. Some interpret this ayah to mean Allah named you Muslim. Others interpret this to mean Ibrahim salam named you Muslim because of his dua, Rabbana waj'alna muslimayni lak. Master, make us Muslim. Wa min dhurriyatina ummatan muslimatan lak. And from our offsprings, from our future generations, at least one nation should be Muslim. So inspired by that, Allah Azzawajal says here, you, you know, you should be you, you are the ones named by Him. Every time you and I go through a struggle, what is this ayah telling us? This ayah is telling us, first of all, struggle is a part of life. That's a part of life. It's second of all telling us that whatever struggles you and I are going through and we still have to hold on to our faith is because we were qualified to. Somebody else, when they went through those struggles, would have left their faith. But you were qualified to hold on. You were qualified to not let go. And Allah will make ease where there's difficulty. Because Allah made ease for your father Ibrahim salam, who put you on this track. You're part of his legacy. And then now this was our history. This is our past. You know, and this is an important thing. Ibrahim salam, is not just called a prophet. Ibrahim salam, is not just a Rasul. He's called our father. Musa salam, Isa salam. Hud, Salih, Shu'aib, when you hear about them, Allah does not use the word father. You know, Allah Azza wa uses that word particularly for Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now the relationship we have with prophets is we respect them and we love them and we want to be la we want to follow their example, etc. But when you say father, then there's a different connection. There's a different connection. You've inherited something. It's part of your identity. This is who you are. Your father's name, your father's legacy is what you carry. This is actually, we are the people of Ibrahim, actually we're the family of Ibrahim salam because of our kalima, because of our shahada. We're his family. To not forget that, you know, somebody reminds you, you know, your grandfather did this, this and this. I, I'm reminded all the time of how, what's happened in the, in the ummah today. What, 50, 60, 70 years ago, so many Muslim countries were under colonial rule. The French, the, the British, whoever else and we were struggling to get away from their rule, not even a century ago. 
and there were our grandparents and their parents, great grandparents, not three generations ago. They were they were st staying in the masajid all night. Ya Allah, remove the rule of these people that have taken and made our deen a fitna for us. We cannot practice our religion. If you give us freedom from these people, we will say La ilaha illallah and we will teach our children La ilaha illallah and we will say your name and we will praise your name and we will obey your Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This was our great grandparents, not even a hundred years ago. Not even a hundred years ago. And two, three generations later, you have those same grandkids, their, their children want nothing more but to be like the colonizers that colonized them. To dress like them, to talk like them, to walk like them, to think that that was superior. That is the superior way of living. Like the Fir'aun used to call his way of living, وَيَذْهَبَا بِطَرِيقَتِكُمُ الْمُثْلَى That the Musa and Harun want to get rid of your exemplary lifestyle. You know, we want to do everything the way we do, even if it compromises our religion. I'm not saying it's not okay to wear a pair of jeans or a baseball hat or, you know, drive a car. I'm not against modernity. But what I'm talking about here is when all of your values, what is right, what is wrong, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, what you love, what you hate, when that's defined by the people your own grandparents were making dua against. When they were begging Allah to give you, free, give your, you freedom from it. We forgot where our fathers were. And somebody shows you just a picture of your grandpa and says, this is the legacy you're carrying, it puts me to shame. Now think, Allah is not just calling on your grandfather, he's saying Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's actually our father. Millata abikum Ibrahim, huwa sammakum al-Muslimin, min qablu wa fi hadha. But we we're not just answerable to the legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam because he's our father. Then Allah adds another dimension to this ayah. And he says, لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ وَتَكُونُ شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ This is where the burden gets heavy. Allah says he'll make the job easy. But well, he didn't end there. He put, and it's not like, oh, no pressure. No, there's pressure. That's the reality of it. The thing is, my job as someone who tries to give khutbah every week is not just to give you false hope. It's not just to give you and myself ayat and reminders that are going to make us feel better about ourselves. With there, if there's a storm coming, and I say, well, I don't want to talk about the storm that's coming, because you'll feel bad, then I'm doing you a disservice. And when the storm finally hits, you're like, why didn't you say anything about a storm? Well, I said, well, it was going to ruin your weekend. I didn't want to tell you anything about a storm because, I mean, it's bad news. People hate the weatherman for enough. So let's just talk about something else. Let's just talk about the game this weekend or something else. Well, there are some things, some realities we have to face, whether we like it or not. They're in the book and we have to face it. He says, لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ So the messenger could be a witness against you, against you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Judgment day comes. Allah is asking for testimony for all humanity. Allah says, لا يتكلمون, Nobody's going to be talking. إلا من أذن له الرحمن Except for the one that Allah gives permission to. Ar-Rahman gives permission to. وقال صوابا And he's going to say the right thing. And that's our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And he's going to speak up on that day. And on that day, among the things he will say is إن قوم اتخذوا هذا القرآن مهجورا My nation, this nation of mine here, abandoned the Qur'an. It was one of the things he'll say in the Qur'an. He will testify for his ummah. He will also testify for those who abandoned the legacy of his, their father Ibrahim. Those who walked away, who didn't care. He's going to testify against some of us. وَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ He was listening to a sahabi recite Qur'an. How will it look when we bring a witness against every nation? وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا in Surah An-Nisa and we will bring you to witness against, stand witness against them this was an ayah in Surah An-Nisa in Medina not even the kuffar, in Medina and the sahabi is listening to, reciting this ayah to him and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I should recite Qur'an to you Qur'an was given to you he said, no, I love listening to it so he starts reciting he gets to this ayah how will it be when Allah makes you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, stand witness and testify against your own people the Prophet couldn't take anymore he said, hasbuk, hasbuk, enough, enough, enough he couldn't take the thought that he's going to be made to testify against his own ummah. The one he cries about every night, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ummati, ummati. لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ But that's not enough. On the one hand, the Prophet is standing there testifying. And if the Prophet testifies, Wallahi al-Azim, I know I'm taking a little extra time. I won't take more than three or four minutes, I promise. If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam testifies, then there's no saving you. And there's no saving me. That's the same Prophet that didn't even ask Allah to change the Qibla. He just looked at the sky. He just looked at the sky and the Qibla changed. 
قد نرى تقلب وجهك في السماء فلنولينك قبلة ترضاها We're changing the direction so you could be happy because we saw you look at the sky Allah says Just look at it when that prophet speaks Allah listens Allah Azza wa Jal gives him what he wants You know Sal tu'ta on judgment day Allah says Ask you will be given Ask you will be given That's the only creation of Allah Allah says that too Ask you will be given on judgment day Ya Rab we don't want him testifying against us, we want him testifying in our favor. We want to be of the ummah that receives the shafa'ah of the Messenger وسلم, but it doesn't come for free. And he adds finally, how will you, how will you be qualified for the Prophet's testimony so he testifies in your favor? Instead of when he gets on the witness stand, he testifies against you and me, he testifies in our favor. The answer is in the ayah, the same ayah, this is all one ayah. وَتَكُونُ شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ And you become witnesses over the rest of humanity. In other words, when people see you, they see La ilaha illallah. When people see you, they see Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He's not here. His ambassadors are here. We're here. Ibrahim alayhi salam is not here. His children are here. When you see the child, you remember the father. That's what's supposed to be the case. We are supposed to be a testimony of Allah by our existence by our existence, over the rest of humanity. When people see us at work, when they see us at the university, when our, when our friends see us, when they interact with us, they know these people are different. They belong to a different kind of family. They have a different kind of allegiance. There's something beautiful about them we haven't seen in anybody else. Let's, what لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ How do we get there? How are we going to be strong enough to be a model for the rest of humanity? Again, let's just conclude this ayah. Allah gives the answer Himself. فَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِاللَّهِ Three things and you'll be qualified. This is your training program. So far it was the job and the responsibility. And if you don't do your job, here's the trouble you're going to get into. Now, finally, how do you prepare for this job? How are you going to get trained for this job? Establish the prayer. Give zakat. Establish the prayer means don't be, don't be lackadaisical about your five prayers. Take them very seriously. Then he says give zakat, which is a, everybody knows if you're qualified, if you make enough money, two and a half percent of your income. But that's not enough. The money you make has to be halal for you to give zakat. If you're earning haram money and then giving two and a half percent of the beer money, that doesn't help anybody. That's not zakat. Because it's not pure to begin with. So your earnings, your, your dealing with Allah is pure. Your dealings with people, the way you make money is pure. وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةِ Then he says, وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِاللَّهِ And hold on for dear life to Allah. Hold on to Allah. What does that mean? He explains it himself. وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ Hold on to Allah's rope. Now he explains that himself. Holding on to Allah means holding on to Allah's words. Having a bond with Allah's words. That will protect you. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us that bond as the month of the Qur'an approaches. وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِاللَّهِ He's the one that's protecting you. He's the one that guards you. He's the one that's securing you. He's your mawla. فَنِعْمَ mawla. What better protector can you have? وَنِعْمَ النَّصِيرَ And what better aid can you have? And these are the last words of this ayah. وَنِعْمَ النَّصِيرَ What better aid? Helper. The word, there are lots of words in Arabic for help. And I leave you with this one. Nusra is used. Nasir is used. When you need help against an enemy. Like if you, I say, hey, could you help me out? I need a pen. Or could you help me out? I need to change a tire. You're not a nasir. But if an army was surrounded and they were about to be annihilated and another reinforcement came and rescued them, that would be their nasir. That's nusra. This is aid, you know, weapons or a new, a new army came to support them. This kind of aid is called nasir. Allah says, Allah is your nasir. You know what that means? That you and I are at war in ourselves. The struggle is a war. And this war needs big help. And no bigger help will come than Allah it's Himself. When you start taking those steps towards Allah, then there is no better aid than Allah Himself. Wa'tasimu billah, hold on to Allah, what better help can you possibly have?